That's what a recession is. So what's coming out of a recession? That means you were contracting, your GDP was falling, then your GDP is only just starting to rise. Seven years after a recession cannot be considered just coming out of a recession. You get what I mean? Right, coming out of a recession will be, okay, the year right after that. Okay, fair. So you, you've got to be very careful with this kind of little things in terms of how you're framing, you know, the context. Right, so the context is, for seven years, they kept rates low. Right, so one argument you can make if you want to talk about this is that after seven years, right, your economy could look like this. Right, meaning you're close to YF at risk of overheating, which is demand pool inflation, right? If AD continues rising. So this gives nice context because in the body of the essay we did talk about how this would be a good way to combat demand for inflation. We know that. So this could serve as a good context as to why they might consider raising rates now. Make sense? After seven years of expansion and growth, you expect yourself to be very close to YF. So it's time to raise rates to prevent the economy from overheating. Oh, hi, you're coming. Oh, you're coming. Okay, so after seven years, right, you're at risk of overheating because your economy has been growing for a long time. You're probably very close to YF ready. Okay, so it makes sense, right, to raise rates. So that's how you want to use it. Okay? Be mindful of the context. Don't tell me coming out of recession is not. Seven years is not coming out of recession. Okay? Another small thing is some of you, when you draw your, a your ADAS, right, you're not very deliberate about what you're showing. So some people tell me that, oh, the impact of raising interest rates is like that. Okay, you, you draw this. Now, strictly speaking, there's nothing wrong with this diagram, right? Because AD falls. But contextually, right, when you're trying to make an argument, this diagram doesn't make any sense. Because then the question, the, the, the marker will circle and be like, why are you releasing inflation in this time? Unless your argument to me, you're trying to tell me that, oh, you know, AD could actually fall too much and it falls into a recession, then fine. But my point is you have to be deliberate about what your diagrams are showing. Okay, it will hurt you indirectly. It wouldn't get a big fat cost, but it will hurt your arguments later on. Your arguments will make sense. Right, then everything will fall apart. Okay, so that's something to um, look out for as well. Um, the other thing is, uh, okay, one more thing about the free eyeball. Some people reference this, you can. Right, this is quite easy. This is actually a limitation of the monetary policy, which is simply that this will hurt economic growth and unemployment. Right? That's what they mean by making the mistake of raising rates. It will be deemed a mistake if it precipitates a recession. Right? Again. Or it causes AD to fall drastically and incomes and, and incomes fall and employment uh, goes down. Right? So there is some there's some utility in the preamble. You just gotta be careful um, with how you use what's in the preamble. Um, the other thing is some answers came in too theoretical, right? Which is, yes, the essay is about the pros and cons of monetary policy, right? The first half, I told you, the low-hanging fruit in this essay is pros and cons of monetary policy. That's the key factors that they will consider first and foremost, right? The Federal Reserve obviously has to care about what the, the, the uh, pros and cons of monetary policy is. But you cannot write the essay without referencing the word factors and framing it as they will consider this, they will consider that because you're not answering the question. Okay, that is an extension of that, right? Some people in their essays very correctly brought in things like SSP. Good, because you realize it's a demand-side-oriented um, 
essay, you realize that there could be some room for talking about supply side policy. But again, you have to be careful here. Because first of all, supply side policy is not administered by the Federal Reserve. The only thing the Federal Reserve administers is either exchange rate or interest rate policy. Everything else is under the government. And the Fed and the government is not the same thing. Okay? So the Federal Reserve cannot employ supply side policy. So how do we introduce supply side policy? You introduce it by pointing out that if they will consider that if the government is employing supply side policy, or if supply side policy is not working, then they will come in and raise interest rates because of XYZ objectives. So one simple example will be, okay, they might consider that well, SSP will increase LRAS and SRAS in order to reduce inflationary pressures. Right? But this happens in the long run. It takes time. Right? If they're at risk of inflation now, they're going to raise rates. This is an example of how to bring it in. You see, because you must remember, the question is asking you what would they consider in their decision to raise rates. So everything that you raise needs to come back and justify and debate whether it makes sense to raise rates or not. Right? You just plug supply side policy in, it wouldn't make any sense. So again, the, the key emphasis is for a question like this, right? It, it met a lot of macro questions generally. The content is not what's going to kill you. Most people will be able to vomit something out that will be relevant to the question. But having good arguments, having points and link back to the question that's very explicit will make or break your essay. You will never cross into L3 if your, if your essay is not written in a way that's debating the question. You need to debate the question. You need to link to the question. You cannot let the marker do the linking for you. Okay? Um, okay, one last thing. A lot of people talked about the impact of raising interest rates, appreciating exchange rates, and the impact of XYZ. This is not wrong. I've often mentioned that in an essay where you talk about uh, monetary policy, um, uh, one of the key mechanisms that a lot of people miss out is actually this. So it's actually, it, it's something that's important, don't get me wrong. But the problem here is a couple of things, right? The first thing is, this is US. Right? You need to keep that in mind. The first thing is, this is US. Most of the time we talk about this is because we need to like, make a case for why a country like Singapore doesn't make sense to use interest rate policy because of exchange rate volatility. Right? So you must think about the contextual relevance of this. Is this going to be a big problem for the US? Right? Because sometime in the last couple of weeks, right, I told you that when it comes to this, uh, you must understand that this chain of events is a maybe, as with a lot of things in macro. Right? There is, this could happen. Meaning, see, uh, when interest rates rise, hot money will flow in, yes. But that's one uh, out of many flows that drives a country's exchange rate. So that might not happen if there are other things happening at the same time. Right? So that's a maybe. That's what I mean by it's a maybe. So you need to ask yourself, right, contextually, how big of a deal would this be for the US and how much emphasis to put on it? So what I'm saying to you is not that you cannot write. It's that a lot of people let this replace a lot of the main monetary mechanism. In other words, if you haven't even talked to me about the basics of what happens to CNI, how it affects AD, growth, employment, inflation, and VOP, please don't talk to me about the secondary effects. Because the primary effects score point. The secondary effects are scenarios. This gives you breath. But you haven't even taken care of the basics. You're not going to score well by bringing things like that in. So the priority must be correct. Right? In macro, you must always distinguish between the will happen and the maybes. The will happens are the primary consequences that always comes first. And then the maybe comes later. I give you another example. Fiscal policy. The will happen is if I increase G today, AV will rise. The maybe is, maybe LRAS will rise also, but it depends on what I put my G into. Make sense? So you need to be very clear about what are the definite things and what are the maybes. So one of the key issues was a lot of people choose to talk about this and talk about, oh, it will improve your current account. So this is, the, this is where the mistake gets a bit fatal. Hey, sorry, you uh, improve your current account in the sense that you reduce the surplus. Yeah, that's what some people say. But what you need to realize is, right, this is a secondary impact. The primary impact uh, of contractionary monetary policy 
is to raise your x minus m. Right? Why? Because when you when you you have contractual monetary policy, two, one of two things happen: four in m y, and four in g p l. This will reduce m. This will increase x and reduce m. So by right, right, this is a strategy to improve a current account deficit. You see the problem? You see why it's important to distinguish between the primary and secondary impact? Because that's how you can decide right, when to use what. So it makes no sense if you tell me that, oh, you know, you raise interest rates because this is the desired outcome. That's nuts, right? What about this? This is what will happen, that is a fact. It will happen because when I contract my economy, you will immediately buy less imports. That's a fact, right? My general price levels, my inflation rate will drop. Imports become less attractive relative to domestic goods, and domestic goods become more attractive as exports. That's a fact. Those things will happen. Your current account will improve. Right? The question is, how does it do at least? Then this is the maybe part. Right? That's what you have to be clear about. Just like how the impact of exchange rate on imported FOP, this is also a maybe. The only reason why we talk extensively about it is because it's relevant to Singapore. As most questions are Singapore re uh, related. So I talked about that a lot. But you need to, again, I emphasize, you need to distinguish between the will happens and the maybe. Right, so this is a very good case of when not having that awareness will be an issue. Right, so I reiterate, the problem is a lot of people, uh, a, a, a few of you, focus on this and say that, oh, the Federal Reserve will consider this and that it will help reduce a current account surplus. Right, it will help to reduce, uh, let me, let me fit there. It will help to reduce a current account surplus. Right, so the scenario is, oh, you guys have a surplus? Then they do this to reduce the current cost of us. Wrong, because you miss this out. This is a key category. Okay? So here's the thing, right? As we as we as you go back and revise and look through your answer and my answer again, here's the message to you. Even when you look at my outline, right? over page 3 and 4. There are a lot of points, right? There are, there are probably more points here than it is practical to include. So, as I say in macro, you know, it's always about point selection, which is your biggest struggle will always be, I look at the essay, I have no idea which one is more important than others. So you need to teach yourself to prioritize. So it starts with things like what I said last week, right? The low hanging fruit is, okay, pros and cons of monetary policy. Pros and cons measure against what? Goals. So the mechanics of monetary policy, the macro goals, the impact, the limitations, that's the first set of things you have to write, those are important. And then within that, I'm teaching you to prioritize primary over secondary outcome. Then you can veer into other stuff. So you cannot have an essay that's just breath. Right? You cannot have an essay that's just depth. You need to have a good blend of both. So knowing what's important, what's coming first, is, 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 is quite crucial. Right? So, from this essay, when, when you go back and revise, the takeaway is why in class, when I explain to you this essay, why did I choose to prioritize some points over the other? Why did I decide these points are more important than others? Right? And in what way are your essays lacking? So when I hear the comments, I tell you, is it a breadth problem? Is it a depth problem? Other things you're not elaborating on? Is it a length issue? Is your you know, content only off? So I think the good news is, by and large, everyone could deliver on the basis of monetary policy and goals. But where there's a bit of a dispersion is some people focus too much on breath and there's a lack of depth and then some people just have too much depth and didn't talk, touch on enough points. But the basics of monetary policy were quite okay. Okay? Questions? Okay. Can you do the last CSP question? So, again another factors question. Right. <clears throat> so I think you can see the pattern. Right? It, it, it is quite a favorite um, style of question nowadays. I don't know if you've seen it in school exams yet, but it will come out. They even like to do it for micro. They started to do it for micro. They can ask you things like discuss the factors that the government will consider in the allocation of resources in education. So it's a market failure question. You just phrase it from a factors point of view instead. So that will change the scope and the phrasing of what you say, but it doesn't change the content. Okay? So the question is, okay, if we ignore the word factors, then the question is really asking you, okay, 
Um, it, in, the, in the context, if you remember the case, the UK and Chinese government are rebalancing their economies. Right? And we're asking you this question in the context of sustained economic growth, so you already know that you have to talk about this. Right? Uh, the rebalancing, of course, for China is from foreign to them domestic. Right? Instead of being so trade dependent, they want to depend more on local consumption. And then the UK is the opposite. So they ask you the factors you know, in their decision to rebalance for growth. So it's very simple. Right? It's basically the pros and cons of the strategy in helping them achieve sustained economic growth. Right? That's your outline. So again, we're back to the standard structure like this. Right? Then the pros and cons, of course, must be res with respect to economic growth. In other words, you need to think in the ADAS direction. Okay? That's basically the question. Then the only thing is you need to just phrase it as, oh, they need to consider this, they need to consider that. Right? In order to satisfy the phrasing of the question as factors or something. Okay? Okay, let's go through <coughs> um, intro, right? As usual, clarity. Two main things. The first one is what sustained Economic growth, so it's actual and PG, right? Actual and potential growth. You want a continuous rise in real GDP and productive capacity. This, the second bullet point is just an elaboration of what requiring actual and potential growth means. So kind of remember, right? That when it comes to economic growth, at the end of the day, the AG component is the one that we care about because this raises real income. And this is the one that gives you real improvements in as well. Right? PG, always remember this, PG by itself has no value. PG's value comes from the fact that PG allows AG to continue into the future. So PG without AG is pointless. AG without PG is not sustainable, so you need both. Right? Because the argument is, if you just keep raising AD, you're gonna, you're gonna hit YF. And always remember, when you hit YF, your growth rate is 0%. You can't grow anymore. Right? That's what it tells you. So it's purely inflationary, which will be a problem. Right? So you want PG to allow income to continue rising. That's the role of actual and potential growth. Okay? Meaning of rebalancing the economy. So China is switching to reduce reliance on the export sector and to instead focus on strategies to generate investment led growth. That's in the context, right? Domestic drivers. UK switching from reliance on domestic consumption to exports to boost growth. So the factors uh, the government should consider in making macro decision in balancing the economy for sustainability, right? That's basically the, the, the direction that we're going in. Okay, so you, you have some freedom in terms of how you want to um, Organize the essay. You can do, do it straight off as a UK versus China. If there are some points that they share, for example, like this one, then you can do government financial position and then you split it into UK and China. It's up to you. All right, as long as you cover both sides and you consider um, the, their considerations in being able to do certain things. So the first point was government financial position. Right. So within the context, right, um, I think this was uh, from the table. And that's the GDP ratio. So for UK, high government debt position, it's difficult for them to sustain policies to boost exports so the policies can be feasible in the short but not in the long run. Right, so again, the key emphasis here is when you do the 10 mark and 8 mark questions, you need to start hunting for facts all across the case. Right, your ability to craft together a good answer, especially a good evaluation, comes from your ability to extract things that people cannot find. Right, because we know that eventually when you build towards evaluation, what do we always say? It depends on certain things. So the more factors you can find that helps you to justify your independence, the better your answer will be. Simple as that. So UK, high debt, China, low debt. So for China, it's possible, right? It's feasible. So they will consider, their, in other words, the phrasing will be, they will consider the government's financial position in their uh, ability, right, to promote the rebalancing. So for example, if you need some details, why is it not uh, sustainable for the UK? Because if you want to boost your exports, right, you want to, Fix, you are effectively trying to fix your export competitiveness. And the best way to do it is through supply side policies. This is expensive. Right? If, especially if you are using interventionist measures. 
right? Of course, we know that for market oriented, it's relatively cheaper. But if you use interventionist, that's not sustainable. You don't have the money to keep spending to build new export industries. So that's a big issue. All right, for China, it's easy. They have low debt, they have the ability to spend more. They can borrow without coming up. Stage of development, okay, the UK is a developed economy that's subjected to high tariffs for exports um, relative to other countries, so that reduces their uh, export competitiveness. So this limits their ability to be export competitive. Now we haven't done tariffs, right? But we're not going to too much detail right now. Tariffs are just a type of indirect tax. Right? You hear you hear a lot of the news nowadays because of Donald Trump. Right? But tariffs are just a tax. So as a developed country, sometimes you face higher taxes on your goods because your export destination is trying to protect yourself. Um, they're trying to protect their own economy against your stuff. So they make your stuff artificially more expensive. So the point is UK might find it challenging to pivot to exports if their exports are not price competitive. They cannot be as cheap as those domestic uh, uh, products. Size of the economy, right? So China having a large domestic economy makes sense. It's easy for them to pivot to rely on domestic consumption. Right, and investments because they have a large domestic economy. Okay? Wait, yeah. Maybe there's a bit of a commenting issue here. Okay, yeah, that's how it should be. Okay? Um, you can ignore this one for now because you have another comparative advantage as well. Just kind of block that out. Okay. Then of course the key consideration as I told you just now will be the benefits and costs of the rebalancing policy. So those are the non-benefit and cost related ones. Like, oh, can they do it? You know, what's the government? You can think of it more as nature of the economy kind of point. Then this is more the pros and cons, right? Does it make sense for sustained economic growth? Okay? So for China, the benefit would be rise in domestic consumption, right? So you improve as well, you raise 80, right? Why? Why is this key? Because remember, C is the component of AD and GDP that actually contributes to material as well. Right? We talked about this right from a VDK yard. Two countries have the same GDP growth rate, same GDP growth. But a country with a higher as well will be the one that has higher consumption. Because consumption drives as well. Right? Um, firms leveraging on domestic consumption are less vulnerable to external shocks, more stable revenue and wage income, more sustainable um, economic growth and increases as well. This is quite important. Huh? This is, I guess, a more general knowledge, more real life thing that's useful for you, even for essays. Because it can come out, they can ask you what's the difference between an economy that's dependent on consumption versus an economy that's dependent on net exports for growth. Right, so if you go back to when I taught you about AD, right? What did I teach you here? I taught you that strictly speaking, how many engines of growth are there only? There's only two. The economy can only either grow by this or this sustainably. Right? Remember us talking about this? I told you that only C and X minus M represents real final demand for goods and services. The economy is all about production. It's all about buying and selling. Right? Which means that yes, you need to produce stuff in order to create jobs. But first and foremost, you need people to want to buy. It's the buying that creates economic activity. It's the spending that creates economic activity. Right? And only C and X represents final demand for goods and services because people are buying to use it. I is dependent on these two things. Because firms do not buy things to use it. They buy things to use it to make more profits in the future. Which comes from selling to end consumers. Right? Whether domestic or foreign. Then government is the worst huh? Because government, the only reason why they are able to spend is because they tax from all the other sectors to generate money to spend. In other words, if all the other sectors are not doing well, people are not buying stuff, the government has no tax revenue. So you can't depend on G. So at the end of the day, if you look around the world, you look around the developed world, there's only two ways that countries get to where they are. Right? One is the American model, where C is 70% of their GDP. So the US has a lot of consumer-centric companies, right? Their biggest companies, before the tech companies come out, are what? McDonald's, 
right, Procter and Gamble, which is all your um, household stuff, right? Um, Coke, we are talking about Pepsi, we are talking about Domino's, all this F and B and buying stuff, that drives consumption, right? That's why they have those industries. China is a very different model. China grew via X, Singapore grew via X. Much of the Asian economies grew via X, right? Your Korea, your Taiwan, your Japan, all grows via export. So there's really only two models in the world. So in the early days when countries want to focus on high growth, they'll pick one of the two, and then eventually they need to rebalance. Otherwise they have an issue. Right? So this is the context of what um, I'm talking about. Now one of the key advantages, of course, right, of relying on C is insulation from global downturns. Right? This was most obvious in China in 2008 and 2009. Every developed country in the world was going through a recession, China grew 7%. At their size, seven percent is nuts. Singapore grows like two to three percent a year. China grew seven percent. Why? They have fiscal policy and they just pump their economy. Right? So they have so much control over their domestic market. It's so big. It allows them to insulate themselves. So China's shift away from exports, right? In reality, actually started from that. Right? Because they know that they cannot depend on the Western world to grow. So they started pivoting inwards. So that's one of the key advantages of relying on C. Of course, on the flip side is if you rely on C only then your growth is restricted to how fast your domestic consumers grow in terms of income and population and demographics. So you have to grow faster, like Singapore, you have to grow faster than yourself to the rest of the world. Right? Because even China is very big, right? They got 1.2 billion or 3 billion people. If they sell to India, they double their addressable market overnight. Right? Instead of just selling to 1.2 billion people, I can now sell to 2 or 1 billion people. That's a much bigger export potential. So pros and cons are right, of course. Xbox is allows you to grow faster, grow bigger, access more markets, more demand. The downside is you're more vulnerable to shocks. Right? If they go into recession, you go into recession. C is you're gonna grow well regardless of how other countries do. Right? But if um, you want to grow faster, then you're gonna be restricted by your own domestic constraints. Okay? Okay, so that's the benefits. Okay, two main arguments. Costs. Okay, in the short run, rebalancing means you'll suffer slower economic growth with slower export growth. So there's an odd cost. What do we mean by that? You see, when you rebalance, right, it's not so easy. It's not today my export, I don't sell so much, tomorrow people will buy more of my things domestically. Right? In other words, growth in C might not offset, slow down, in X. <clears throat> you get what I mean? If you're transitioning right, that means you are putting policies to drive C instead of putting policies to drive X. Agree? So in so doing, you expect your X to decline, your X to grow more slowly. But if my C doesn't wrap up as quickly as my X is declining, then in the short run, I'm going to suffer in terms of growth. It will be slow or you'll even be negative. Make sense? I give you a simple example. Um, like in Singapore today, okay, let's just talk about Singapore today. So of course we're trying to transition into higher paying jobs. Right? So Singapore's rebalancing is of course not from X to C. Our rebalancing is trying to move across economy, uh sorry, across industries, right? You want to reduce reliance on like the more low end manufacturing and pivot to tech, banking, services and so on. Right, what's the issue? The issue is in the short term, if you stop supporting these weaker industries, people are gonna lose their jobs they're not going to be able to immediately transition easily into the higher paying jobs, into the service oriented jobs. Correct, so it doesn't happen overnight. There's always a transition process. So the transition process here is that you might suffer from lower growth rates in the short term. Okay? And lastly is higher consumption. Higher consumption could cause household debt to rise. Right? Could cause household debt to rise because households could borrow to finance their spending. And of course, in this context, it has to be about durables, or it has to be about housing. Because these are only two categories of things that you borrow to buy. Now if that's the case, right, if household debt gets too high, cannot borrow to spend in future. Right? Then you will slow down. Right? Your consumption will not be able to keep driving growth for you if that were the case.
right? For the UK, the benefit, contextually, we know that they have really high household debts, right? They talked about this. I think that was the last extract before the question. So right? they talked about how, oh, you know, with higher rates, because of the high household debt, they will struggle. So of course, if they pivot away from consumption as a growth model, they stop, for example, giving them cheap credit, right? The household borrowing rates will fall. So it helped them improve as well because they wouldn't have to spend so much money on repaying loans, right? They wouldn't be so indebted. And that will actually um, increase as well, right? Reduce repayment burden. Okay? Expansion of markets for US, uh, UK firms, sorry, incentivizes UK firms to be more innovative and compete in the market and improve their trade balance to get sustained economic growth. Right? So the, pay the, the payment is good because right now the scenario is that UK firms are not very competitive. So what we're trying to say here is that the benefit is if you improve export competitiveness to boost X in your rebalancing, then not only will you improve your current account, it will help you to achieve your growth of sustained economic growth, right? Because your X can continue rising over time. They're building a new industry to drive economic growth. Okay? Last year, we had FDI, you'll be more attractive to capital inflows, right? If you pivot from a slow growth model hampered by the over dependence on consumption towards one that's more sustainable. Right, which is one of the export growth. So you could check FDI, capital inflow, it will give you potential um, economic growth. Okay, the downside, government policies are targeted at reducing C, right? They're trying to um, clamp down on household spending. So you're gonna have short-term pain, okay? And especially in terms of SOL, also spend less, Naturally, it means that they're not going to um, have that much to consume and then materials all goes down. Uh, government expansion of export promotion prices, there could be an up cost, very standard argument now, which is they spend here, you're not spending in other areas, right? So, especially if you link this to like supply side policy, right? Because there's this whole part that they talk about how they want to restructure the economy, they want to uh, improve competitiveness by doing infrastructure and all that, indeterminate outcomes. Right, and lastly, reliance on export sector, yes, well, good, also creates vulnerability to external shocks, as I just mentioned to you. Okay, so they consider all these things, they consider all the pros and cons, all the different considerations. Evaluation is quite standard. The fundamental message, because this, this is still like a policy question. Yes, it's about goals. Yes, it's about factors. But they're talking about, hey, does it make sense for the government to rebalance? So there's a policy angle to it. In other words, in evaluation, it's always this, right? Short run, long run, take on the policy. Right, which means, yes, you should rebalance. It makes sense to rebalance, but you need short-term mitigating measures. Right, it's always like that. That's always how we do this. How much should implement policy to mitigate short-term costs? Right? UK are a large domestic market who still rely on the domestic market for growth, but given the high debt, the intended outcome of this strategy may not be seen in the short term. Okay? In rebalancing economy for sustainable growth, a more feasible strategy is for them to reduce reliance in any one sector of the economy, be it domestic or export. Okay? Um, and the last one is, wait, I think this is a yeah, okay, this is a repeat point. Uh, we continue on the imbalances part. Imbalances in any economy are usually not sustainable, although small open economies like Singapore inevitably more reliant. Right. So don't really agree in Singapore because they they are that's not explicitly being asked for. We're focusing on UK and China. But because you have to mark Singapore anyway, right? Singapore serves as a very useful counter argument that you can raise to say, oh, you know, for a big country like UK, you know, versus something like Singapore, Singapore got no choice. We're very export dependent. 
Right, but from something like UK, they have the option of being dependent on domestic and foreign in order to drive their growth more sustainably. Okay, so you don't have to bring in Singapore. It's useful. I mean, you have the knowledge anyway, so you can use it as a very useful contrast. Okay? Any questions? No? Okay, let's turn to Singapore then. So, characteristics first are um, some data for you to use. You don't have to memorize everything, but if it you can remember it, it's useful. Okay? First of all, we know that it's trade dependent. The data they will always cite is that X plus M is almost 400% of GDP. How that's possible is because X minus M is only about 30% of GDP. And because GDP is CGIX minus M, right? But X plus M is almost 400% of GDP, which means that our trading volume, what comes in and out, the amount of goods and services, that comes in and out of Singapore is about four times the size of our GDP, which is a lot. Now, I want to explain something to you, right? A lot of people get very confused now because technically speaking, right, if you go and look at our economic data, um, C, right, is about 30% of our GDP. And then X minus is also about 30% of our GDP. So then you will, if you think about it, you're like, why is X exports more important for us, right? Why is export more important for us if, if C is about 30% and X minus N is about 30%? Right? It seems a bit counterintuitive if you like. Then, then why is our export such a big deal? Correct? So here's the thing. Our X uh, is 200% of GDP. Okay? You contrast that with a country like China. A country like China, their X minus N is also about 30% of GDP. But their X alone might only be 40% of GDP, for example. Okay? That means in this equation, what I'm trying to tell you is that this is like 40%, this will be like 10%. So X minus M is 30%. Okay? So here's the issue. When the global economy goes into decline, okay, that's globally GDP is falling. Okay? So let's say globally GDP is dropping by 10%, right? <coughs> hypothetically, okay? That means income so far is dropping by 10%, right? Can we say that in such an instance you expect demand for goods and services globally to drop about 10%? Of course, this will dep depend on YED, right? For one dollar drop in income, how much there'll be a drop in demand on spending, right? That will depend on YED. But we can largely agree that if GDP is falling 10% around the world, then demand is falling by about 10%. Fair, fair assumption? Make sense? You will sell 10% less goods. Right? If you sell, sell like 100 cars every month, you expect to sell 90 cars now. Quite logical, right? So let's look at what happens when China's export drops by 10%. So now this drops to 36. In other words, the, the impact on overall GDP is probably about minus 4%. Make sense so far? Because uh, it's forty percent of their GDP, right? So if I reduce my export sectors by ten percent, it drops to thirty six. I only lose four percent of GDP. If Singapore gets hit, ten percent of this is twenty percent of GDP. You see the problem? Now you understand where the export reliance comes from. So no one asks you to explain any of this in the essay. I'm trying to make make sense of it for you. So the point is, Singapore will face a substantial. Fall in X when there's a global recession and there'll be a significant decline in AD because of this. That's why I did the figures. All I need you to do is to cite 200% of GDP. Right? X is 200% of GDP. Such that when the global economy falls, there'll be a substantial decrease in X and a substantial decrease in GDP. Particularly because our M is quite sticky. We expect that our X will fall substantially more than our M would. Our M will fall a bit, for sure, right? Because uh, as our economy contract, we also buy a bit less imports. Right? As our trading partners buy less from us, we'll import a bit less raw materials. But the bulk of what we import will not fall. You still need to eat. You still need to buy cars. Almost everything we eat, use in our day-to-day -day life are important. So you expect your X to decline more than your M, you expect yourself to face a big 480 and a big 480. 
Okay, so this is a bit of context for you to understand why. Okay, we've got a second business point of work. I don't think this is true anymore. We are still top five, but I think we might be like third or fourth. I think the top two now, one of them is China's port. I think it's the Shanghai, Shanghai port is like the busiest in the world. So but I can't be sure. Like, no. you, can, you can change it to top five. But no one's going to fault you. Like, if you write this, they're not going to be like, oh, you know, wrong, you can't get L3 because it's not the second DJ3. Right? It was, I think, just like one or two years ago, it still was. We are resource scarce, obviously. So, uh, in terms of production capacity, LRAS growth. Um, we are limited by how much FOP we have, so we largely grow by productivity and efficiency, which is about quality of FOP. So this is where our education system comes in. We are very big on this because of our resource constraint, and we care a lot about this as well. Okay. Now here's the thing. Actually, if you look back a bit in history, right, this is not entirely true of Singapore. So we did take a shortcut for a long time, you know, after independence. Which is we grew, right? We grew LRAS by doing two things. One is reclamation. This is huge. I think our reclaimed land mass is about 20% of Singapore's total land mass right now. That's a lot, huh? 20% of, of what used to be Singapore um, is reclaimed. Right? So the whole marina area, I think that's the more prominent one everyone will know. Basically, the whole marina bay sands area, the entire stretch was all sea. There was nothing there. So that part was entirely reclaimed all the way until MBFC. Right, the Marina Bay Financial Center, where you see the stand chart and the DBS, that's all reclaimed land. And there's a lot of reclamation in the East Coast um, area as well. So if you compare photos in Singapore, right, there are some parts where there's houses and all that now, it used to be sea. Okay, that's uh, the East Coast and the Marina stretch. So land reclamation was big for us. And obviously, this. Right. When I was in primary school, which is obviously a very long time ago, 20 odd years ago, our population was 3 million. Today it's 5 plus. But our local population is still only 3.5. And, and this is probably including like you know your PRs and the citizens that converted over the years. So that tells you how little, like how big the birth rate problem is and how much of our population growth was due to immigration. Our population size almost doubled over 20 years, but the bulk of it was immigration. So that's a quantity of FOP point. Okay? So actually we cheated over the years. Right, which is, yes, we are resource strapped, but because of globalization, we were able to do this. This was a big deal for us. Without globalization, you know, the immigration thing would have been possible. And we honestly have grown a lot slower. Okay, so we reclaim land and there's immigration. But now moving forward, this is this is the difficult decades that we have ahead. Because there's no low-hanging fruit to growth anymore. Right? You cannot you cannot let immigrants come in really. People are really extremely unhappy. There's friction, the infrastructure is under stress, housing is an issue, public transport is an issue. Right? And immigration does depress wages to some extent. So they've got to turn off that tap. We already maximum land reclamation really, pretty much. Right? The rest is going to be too costly to reclaim. So what do you have left? You have no choice. You definitely have to go down this route. Hence, the government is pushing the retraining, the R&D, and so on. Okay? High savings rate, the biggest impact is on multiplier. Right? That's the biggest thing you have to care about. Um, how CPM works, um, good for general knowledge also, is let's say you earn a thousand a month, right? So 200 a month out of this will go towards your CPF. So you only take home 800. But the good news is your employer will contribute an extra $170. So in essence, right, you're actually earning a like thousand one hundred seventy. But 370 goes into CPF, and then $800 goes into your bank account that you can spend. That's how CPF works. So the big deal is if you add these two up, right, the savings rate uh, is almost 30%. Right? The marginal propensity to save, the MPS is 30 over percent. Right? Because you have to take 370 divided by 1,170. 1, so that's like about 32, 33%. That's a very, 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 very high savings rate. Just to give you a contrast, right? US is nuts. US savings rate is almost non-existent. It's single digit. That's how low it is. Right? There is no concept of savings which is astounding for Asians, but it's normal for them, right? We are, we are we're talking aggregate numbers, right? Of course, there are people who say, don't get me wrong, but by and large, savings is a non-existent concept in the Western world. Okay, so very high savings rate, very high NPS, um, small multiplier on that front. Now, quick thing, okay, just want to re remind you of something. This is something relevant for CSQ. 
I just use MPS as an example. Uh, this marginal propensity to save, right? The word marginal is very important. I always teach you, you see marginal, think about extra. Extra dollar of income I earn, how much of it do I actually save? That's what MPS means. I can give you a related concept also called APS, which is average propensity to save. Right? It's still a marginal propensity to save. You know what the difference is? So this is extra dollar, what percentage do I save, right? APS will be savings over income. Okay. More commonly, they will give you as MPT, marginal propensity to tax, and average propensity to tax. So marginal propensity to tax will be how much extra income goes into taxes, average propensity to tax is total tax paid over total income. Why am I bugging you about this? Because they have tested this before in the sense that they give you a table of average propensity you save, average propensity you tax, and they ask you, what do you think is the size of the multiplier of this country versus another country? Okay? You know what I'm saying? So if I tell you the average propensity you save, uh, okay, in Singapore, it's, let's say 0 0.2. Okay, hypothetical, uh, I tell you the average propensity you save is 0 0.2. That means total savings over total income in Singapore is 0 0.2. Okay, then I tell you another country's APS is 0.8. Okay? So I ask you which country has a bigger multiplier. Now, so you might be trying to say something like, oh, this one has a lower APS, so K bigger. Correct? What's the problem? The problem is K depends on MPS, MPT, MPM, not average propensity. So you need to take an extra step whereby you say, we can agree that generally, if you have a higher average propensity to save, you will have an average, you will have a higher marginal propensity to save. Correct? The correlation is logical. That the higher your average propensity to save, higher average propensity to tax, the higher your marginal rates will be as well. So you cannot say that, oh, the multiplier is bigger because of higher average propensity to tax or average propensity to save. You will get marked down for that. You need to take an extra step. To say that if the APS and APT is high, we expect the MPS and MPT to be high. And thus we expect the multiplier to be small. Okay? So nitty gritty terminology like that, right, they can test you in CS3 to test your understanding. Hmm? So that means something to pay attention to. Right. Okay. Um, in terms of our monetary policy, we choose exchange rates over interest rates. You know this already. Um, two major reasons, right? Two major reasons. One is the volatility um, in exchange rates that we cannot stomach if we choose interest rate policy because we are small and open, right? And the, the, the significance of that is you can think of it as Singapore's domestic monetary transactions, right? Is way smaller relative to the amount of money that's flowing in and out of Singapore. You know why? Because we have an international banking status, right? Which is a lot of people bank here. We literally bank for the rich people in the region. That's why you think about it, huh? we only have three local banks, actually. DBS, OCBC, UOB. You go to like the uh, Rebels Place area, you can count the number of banks you see. We have like more than 15. Okay, all the international banks are here. Citibank, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, right? Then you got the China banks, Bank of China, Right, you got ICBC, you got State Bank of India, you got Stanchart, you got HSBC, all of these are foreign banks. They're all here, they're holding deposits here. They're banking for the region and banking for the Westerners. So the amount of money that foreigners park here relative to how much the locals park are is massive. In other words, if I control interest rates and my hot money flow keep flowing in and out, my exchange rates will go crazy. Because the amount of money flow is just massive. That's the significance of being a small and open economy. If you are large and open, not so bad your domestic transactions will still be a sizable volume of the money moving in out of your country, right? which is more stable. But relative to the amount of uh, domestic money, we have a lot of money for it. There's going to be a lot more sensitive interest rates. Okay, so I'm giving you the background. All I need to say is this, right? Huge exchange rate fluctuation, we are small and open, hot money flow, volatile, bad for us, which correlates to our second point, that we are X and M dependent. That's why we cannot sum up the volatility and to a smaller extent, we are FDI dependent as well. Okay, I'll revisit the FDI point when we do globalization.
But basically, we are small and open, so open means volatile, small means we are dependent on foreign. So we cannot allow our exchange rates to be volatile. Okay? Our natural rate of employment, unemployment is about 2%, it's the lowest in the world. Um, about 2%, uh, which means that we typically, the max max we can go is like 1.8, 1.9, I think, historically. Right? And this is not normal. US right now is at 3.6 or 3.7%, right? it's at a three decade low or something. But Singapore, the norm is we will hover around to. Right? Europe, a good rate of unemployment is like 8. Singapore, by the time we hit it, uh, screw it, really. everyone will be on the streets having riots and so on. Okay? So, wh why is there such a big disparity? So, I always draw this diagram to illustrate this point. Okay, why, why is Singapore's natural rate of unemployment so low? Like, um, 2%, why can't other countries attain it? Okay, very simple. You compare Europe okay, to Singapore. Okay, the PPCs are different, uh, separate. Uh, okay. A 8% unemployment rate in Europe, okay, on the PPC, might look like this. Okay, let me see. Here, this is the full employment, uh, right? So it might look a bit like that. Singapore's unemployment rate at 8%, is likely to look something like that. I'm exaggerating a bit, right? but you get the idea. Lah. I'm trying to tell you that there'll be a very big difference in how it showed. Do you know why? So I'm telling you it's going to be a lot bigger problem for us when we are 8% of the system. Why? Because the PPC shows you the max output that you can produce in your economy, right? Using what? Labor? No, everything, right? So when you talk about unemployment rate, it's just for labor. But because the bulk of Singapore's FOP is labor, on the PPC, from a PPC's perspective, a 8% unemployment rate is a very big problem for us. Our loss of income and output is massive. But for Europe, they have a lot of natural resources. They have a lot of land, right? They have a lot of capital. Such that even if they have 8% rate of unemployment, the loss of income could only be this small. You get what I mean, right? That means if I contrast EU and Singapore, if the pie represents the total amount of FOP they have, maybe Europe is like that. This is labor. Singapore is like that. Again, I'm exaggerating, but you get the idea. So for us, if our unemployment rate hits anything close to like 5%, it's catastrophic. Right? Because we depend very heavily on people to generate resources. So a simple, a simple mental picture is this, you see, in Europe, right, let's say you own a vineyard, that means you grow grapes and all that to make wine, right, let's say you do 5 million, 10 million in sales a year, the vineyard needs like 5, 10 people to run max, right, because you just plant, it, it, it's actually very, you need very, very little people, you only need people in harvest season, but apart from that, you need very few, very few people, you go and visit vineyards, you'll get an idea, vast tracts of land, you can sell millions of wines a year, you don't really need that many people. You need like two people to like, uh, you need one person to take care of the plants, like make sure that they're healthy and so on, but you don't do the menial things. You need one person to blend, one or two person to blend the wines, and that's it. That's it. The rest of the thing can automate. The whole fermentation process and crushing and all that, all can automate. So you can do that. But for Singapore, right, in Singapore to generate 10 million in sales, you're typically looking at like a shop, a restaurant, all these things that need a lot of people because it's all service line. So you, you get the idea? Like a loss in 10 million, like Singapore, there's a lot of people not working, you're basically screwed. Europe is not that big a deal. Because much of the income is being generated by the fact that they have land and capital and they can use all these other things. Okay? So that's why it's like that. Even soy and, and, and whatever, the harvesters are massive, you don't need people. Still at the lowest in the world. Sorry? Are we the lowest, lowest? In the world? Yeah. In the developed world, I think so. I, I don't know, like, I didn't see an international ranking table for unemployment rate. But we were probably one of the lowest. Um, um, lowest in the developed world, that one I'm quite confident. Developing, I'm not so sure. But I would gather if you're lowest in the developed, you're probably lowest in the developing also. Because developing is probably a lot worse. 
Okay, macro problems and situations. So the first one is economic growth. Um, we are prone to external fluctuations. Right? FDI is about 20% of the economy. Uh, C is about 37% of the economy. So that's what I'm trying to tell you, right? If you look at the C and X minus M data, we're like 10. We are 10 to the 10 lowest. Bruh, yeah. We're like literally like not even that good anymore. Oh my god. We're failing. But here's the interesting thing, right? Like, yeah, all the developing countries are under us. Uh huh. But you need to take this in context with the labor participation rate. Because Cambodia could be very low, but okay, so f f let me let me try something first. When you look at developing countries, right, the first problem you need to ask yourself is how robust is the data collection? How do they measure that our unemployment rate is like 1%? You get what I mean? So we know for a fact that Singapore's unemployment data is freaking robust. They know everyone down, like, like some people always say it's in Singapore, right, yeah, just a barcode. The boys will experience it because when you go to NS, right, they scan your IC, they know everything about you. There's no registration form, there's nothing, there's nothing to key. They know exactly who you are, where you went to school, and how you did, and so on. So um, unemployment data is extremely robust. You look at Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and all that, right? Do they even have accurate census data? Do you know where everyone is and where everyone is staying? So, yes, I mean, on the surface, maybe we are not the lowest, but in terms of the strength of our data, we're probably the best. So, we can probably claim to be one of the lowest unemployment rates in the world. You get what I mean? Like, even China has the same problem. Like, no one trusts China's data. China is like, oh, we grow 6% a year in GDP, but people are like, no, I think it's more, probably closer to 1%. Right? Because the Chinese government is known to juice their data. You guys look at China's growth rate, right? Over the last 10 years, sorry, the line are almost looks like that. That means it's a, it's a slow down trend as well. 7%, 7.7? Now it's like 6.5. There's nowhere else on earth, right? You can find a country that GDP trend look like that. More realistically, it looks something like this, right? Kind of business cycle. So people know that China is juicing their data because the government will set a target at the start of every year. They're like, we all go 6.6% this year. And they always shit about that. Maybe they'll miss, but they'll be like, oh, we 64 this year because the economy is, you know, because of trade war and all that. So that happened last year. They started with, I think they projected 65 last year, they did like 6.2, despite the trade war and, and so on. Right? So the data collection robustness is, a, is actually a big factor in real life when you do macro. When you do case study, you take it as spec, you're like, oh, you know, this country go. But in real life, it actually matters a lot. Okay. So the line? China, yeah, everyone knows that they lie. It's a fact. Everyone knows that China lies, but there's no way, like, how do you go in and verify that data? Right? But they, they, they try and give it, like, they're guessing that if China is growing X amount of percent a year, their car sales cannot be so bad because if people are earning money, they should be buying cars. So they, they try and do it like in real life it's not so easy. It's not so easy to collect GDP data. You have to estimate. That's why you have three methods, right? You got expenditure, you got income, you got output method. Because in real life you really need three methods. How do you know that your method is correct? You can't gather data on everything that you need. So you need to estimate. Make sense? That's why when I teach you, right? I told you the income method is quite useful because for a lot of countries you See, see this, is, this is also contingent on you collect, collecting your taxes. But if you know what your tax rates are and your collection rate is close to 100%, then how much taxes you collect can help you proxy for how much income is earned. Ignoring the fact that people might escape taxes and, and so on. So that's a good proxy, that's one. The other one that's very useful will be like GST data. They can help you estimate output. But again, there are companies that don't pay GST or like illegally avoid GST. So in real life it's not easy. How do you calculate? How do you really calculate the economic output in the country? But China is known to be the biggest liar. Yeah. Okay. So anyway. Um, I talk extensively about this just now, so I'm not gonna uh, talk too much. LRS, as I said, dependent heavily on productivity and efficiency growth. Unemployment, um, what, now my whole point of illustrating this to you was is that basic unemployment is a big issue. For Singapore, we cannot afford for unemployment rate to be high. Um, the, most, the most problematic unemployment for us will obviously be structural, just like anyone else. The one that we cannot help is cyclical, because we're very dependent on the global economic cycle. So that's kind of inevitable. Um, frictional and seasonal unemployment is not really that big of an issue. Lah. Especially for frictional, I mean, Singapore is really small. Right? So it's not difficult for the flow of information to reduce frictional unemployment compared to a larger 
country where it's a very real issue where if you're in LA, you have no idea there's a job for you in New York, right? Maybe you can argue that, oh, these, are, these two are big cities. Maybe it's easy to find. Yeah, sure. But if you're in LA, then do you know if there's a job in Omaha for you? Wherever where the hell is Omaha, right? So it's not, not a big issue for Singapore, bigger for bigger countries. Okay? If th this, this one, let's keep in mind because again, it's something a bit trade related. Um, and I'll come back to that after we have done trade. But the whole point is, for Singapore, right, our biggest risk as far as employment goes is structural unemployment because you're an open economy, which means you're always competing in all other countries. So when other countries get better than you at doing certain things, it puts you out of business very, very, very quickly. So if you look at Singapore's story, actually over 50 years, right, our transformation is nuts. Not just in terms of speed of growth and incomes, but really the different economic models that we go through is crazy. Like even if you look at countries like US, right, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, their agricultural sectors are still huge. Although they go through industrial revolution, they got very big manufacturing and all that, right? Agriculture is still massive. Like you just drive through any countryside, Australia, New Zealand, UK, uh, you get an idea. There's a lot of sheep, there's a lot of greenery, there's a lot of empty land. So while their economies transform, these industries survive. In Singapore, right, there's, there's nothing. We have like one chicken farm, right? We, we actually getting a bit better now because of vertical farming and all that, but those industries got wiped out. We used to produce cars here. Right, like Toyota, Volkswagen, and all that, they produce cars here. Singapore had car manufacturing plants. It's totally gone now. Right, those jobs have gone to Thailand and Malaysia. So Singapore is, is really crazy. Like, the rate of evolution of industries really, 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 really fast. So when you pick your, your career, right, better pick something with longevity. You pick it too niche, maybe in 15 years you lose your job. Because that thing can be overtaken by someone else. So that's what this point is about. Right, that structural unemployment remains our biggest risk. That's why the government is retraining and so on. Okay, very big deal. Inflation. If we were to say what's our most important macro goal, if you are really forced to pick one, regardless of context, then inflation will be the one. Why? Again, comes back to X and M. Right? Inflation will be the biggest risk to our export competitiveness, so that's extremely important. At the same time, we are extremely vulnerable to cost push inflation from imported. Uh, inflation. So our uh, management of inflation, right, always starts with managing cost push, then managing demand pool to some extent. Because the cost push will feed directly into our export competitiveness. So Singapore really cannot afford to get cost push inflation. It will really kill us. Again, that goes back to why we control exchange rates and not interest rates. Okay? BOP, simple lah. BOP, we are always in surplus on us. Right, current account is always in surplus. Financial account is largely in deficit. What that means is Singapore is a net investor, right? Overseas financial account. So we have hmm? that's very good. That's very good. So I think the, the data was that I think one or two years ago we were the biggest investor in the US, only behind China. That's massive, huh? we are tiny. Huh? But Singapore's fund outflows in the US, right, is the second highest. Um, of all FDI in, in, in the US. We're just behind China because a lot of Chinese people go there and buy houses. Right? And China companies are snapping up assets there also. But Singapore is right behind them. How? Um, huh? we, the, the country is quite rich now. So a lot of investments actually in Singapore will be done through GIC and domestic. But that's basically Singapore's money. Like the surpluses are built up from the fact that we have a current account surplus. So the government is a big participant, of course, but we have private enterprises investing also. Okay, yeah. Um, of course, our BOP is going to short term fluctuations, uh, so it's not surprising if you can get a short term current account deficit. Now, just a quick note, okay? When we talk about BOP, uh, when we talk about current account surplus and deficit, and even when we talk about government fiscal surplus and deficit, right, it's always important to make the distinction between whether you're talking about annual or cumulative. You get what I mean? Like, current account deficit, right? Are you talking about the deficit for one year? For one quarter, or are you saying that the country has a build up of current account deficit over time? I'm just saying that when you write, you just make sure you are being clear. Because Singapore has a current account surplus built up over time. We have cumulatively had X more than M over time. But it's possible to have a current account deficit at a moment in time. Right? For that one year. That means I've reduced my surplus because of my that year deficit. Same for government fiscal budget. Okay? A government running a fiscal deficit doesn't necessarily have to borrow if they have built up a surplus over the years. 
You just kept on saving stuff. Okay? Make sense? So just be mindful of this little bit. Okay? Okay, solutions. What do we do? Now, whatever I'm telling you here, right? Just be aware here. Okay? Everything that's here is not meant to go. Everything that's here, this part, especially of body, nothing is meant to go into the body apart from the examples. Okay? But of what is here, right, are to show you what your what's the evaluation you need to build towards. Which is what Singapore does in real life. Because remember, your body is always about scenarios. You don't talk about real life, what your real life comes later in evaluation. So keep that in mind. Okay? Now, demand oriented supply side policies, that's what we do. So Singapore doesn't do, do pure FP1. We almost never just spend for the sake of it. Okay? If we spend and there's a G, it will always be supply oriented. Very, very clear on. So look at Singapore over the years. All the stuff that the government builds, right, all has the supply side angle to it. So one of the biggest expenses is obviously MRT. Right, for a country so small, I think we are going towards six or seven lines already. London is bigger than us, they only have 10. And they build it over 100 over years. Right, we have six, close to six, seven in like 50 years. Or probably less. Okay, so that's one example. I give you a ton of examples here. Okay, so our G will go into things like land reclamation, building new expect This was of course a big, a big deal, right, in the, in the early days. Um, but not so much now. New expressways, new MRT lines, all the various hubs that they do. So of course, if this is brought up in the firm's context, then you know there's an EEOS angle to this, external economies of scale. Right? The benefit of concentrating firms in one area, they have cost savings, they share R&D, right? stuff like that. Jewel, that's the latest one, massive. Have you gone? Have you gone? How was it? Crazy pack. There were only queues for food and the Pokemon stores. Yeah, that, that's, that's Singapore, like, that's that's Singapore, Singapore for you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But what else is there? I mean, it's just shopping, right? Shopping and food, right? Yeah, but yeah, the Shake Shack queue was like, it yeah. was like multiple floors. Yeah, I, I'm not going to go to Jewel for that. But my friend queued for Pokemon stores. So we got to go in like the first batch. Oh, nice. Okay, so Jewel, the latest one. Um, CET program is related to the skills future and the workforce thing. Uh, basically, the government spend money, they build training institutes, they spend money to train workers as well. So, give me a quick tip, okay? Generally, right, if you want to tilt your G to have supply side impact, uh, the easiest thing to do, right, is to link it to infrastructure. In other words, uh, even if you want to link to R&D uh, or education and training, for example, let me give you a tip, okay? The easy low-hanging fruit is to say, oh, the government can spend money on building training institutes to house people who need to do training and education. Why do I say that? Because you need to remember, uh, G, for it to qualify as G, it must be a spending on a final good or service. So some people have a problem explaining that. They say, oh, you know, the government can... Uh, hire people and all that to do training. Then there's a problem because that technically doesn't qualify as a final spending in and service. So the easiest low hanging fruit is just to tune everything in the infrastructure direction. Then they spend on something real. Now if you have to be a bit more precise, right? One way you can talk about it is, see, when the government supports training program, if the government pays for training programs, conducted by like external vendors and all that. Let's say the government pay hypothetically Harvard Business School, right? They kind of conduct seminars, like 10 week seminars and all that. That can be considered a G. Because they're spending on a service. They are paying a vendor to kind of provide the service, right? So that's how you can link fiscal policy with education and training under interventionist SSP. That's a more precise way to link it because the government is spending on the service for people to benefit. But the easiest, the lowest hanging fruit is to always take the infrastructure stance. Oh, they built this new training institute where? Easiest. Confirm qualify as a G. Okay? Same for R&D. The low hanging fruit will be, oh, they spend money on uh, uh, building a new research institute. Buying machines. Buying things that's needed for R&D. Easiest. You talk about hiring people, then it, it starts to complicate things. Okay? Now, the truth is that for Singapore, right, pro-competition policy are very, very, very little. Very, very, very little. The biggest thing, right, the biggest thing is startups, really. That's all. Labour market policy is almost non-existent. In fact, Singapore's movement in recent years is to move away from market-oriented labour policies. You know why? 
because the market oriented labor policies are killing people. We've got no minimum wage. Our union doesn't do what overseas unions do. Right? So it's a problem because a lot of people cannot earn enough, you know, wages are being depressed, people are struggling under the free market model. We have a very good free market model for wages. We got no unemployment benefits, right? We have very low income tax rates, but we also got no minimum wage, we got no labor protection and all that. Apart from like, you know, you treating workers. So our wages are a very free market, very, very free market, very competitive, but that has create problems. Not from an economic competitiveness perspective, we have benefited a lot. People want to invest here, people want to be here, our economy is growing precisely because of our market-oriented stance on wages right from day one. But that has created problems in terms of income inequality, standard of living, and so on. Okay, so we will, what I'm saying to you is that we will lack examples of Singapore government pushing market-oriented SSP. So I'm telling you, don't worry, like, there isn't, just isn't real life examples. We just don't have, our economy was set up to have all of this to begin with. So there's nothing we can do already, nothing to dismantle. The only thing that they are pushing harder on is this. So this is a very good thing to use. So the government is still pushing very heavily in terms of market-oriented supply-side policies to encourage startups. They're making it easier for companies to start here, easier for people to get funding, easier for people to meet investors, and, and, and so on and so forth. So that's a big thing. Then apart from that, the bulk of it is all the interventionist stuff. Okay? Singapore government is actually really hands-on. So interventionist is a very big part of supply side policy. Tax policies, okay, this one just more as a side note thing because um, it's just if you have need to come up with examples, I'm telling you how to come up with it. We almost never cut taxes one. Okay. In real life, uh, it's not just Singapore, okay. In real life, right, no country right keep changing the tax code uh, just to employ fiscal policy, right? That's crazy. It's too much work. Okay? But next time when you get wealthy, right, you realize that you might actually need an accountant to do your taxes for you. So filing taxes even for individuals is not an easy thing because when you get wealthier, right, you're not just filing your earned income tax. What about your investments? What if you buy a house in London and you collect rental? How do you treat the how do you treat the the tax? Do you have to pay tax here? Do you pay tax in London? Where, where do you pay tax? How much tax do you pay? What if you sell the house and the house price go up? Do you pay tax on that? So all these things, right, is called the tax code. So it's not as simple as, oh, let's just you know, cut taxes because of fiscal policy or raise taxes. So in practice, most countries do uh, do this. They either tax breaks or they do tax rebate or they do temporary tax cuts. So a simple example would be, oh, let's say the government wants to stimulate the economy. They say everyone this year, you pay $1,000 less income tax. That would be fiscal policy. It wouldn't be lowering the income tax rates. Huh? No one does that. That's insane. They will add. A few years ago, Singapore government at the highest tier, 22% for income tax. They will add. They will never cut. Right? Because it doesn't make sense. Unless you have a very good reason that you want to cut the income tax permanently. Right? Like, let's say France. France is the highest tax bracket now is like 70%. There's a good reason for them to take that away if they want to attract like high net worth individuals to move there. Right? But apart from that, most countries don't have a reason to want a consistently low tax rate. Right? Especially Singapore, we're already so low. So we'll never cut, we'll give tax rebates. Tax rebate, corporate tax break, or GST vouchers as a form of temporary tax cut. But never outright. What's a GST voucher? You, know, uh, you all don't get it, that's why you don't know. So GST voucher is the government literally giving money back to households. Uh, they use it as a redistributive tool. How much you get as an individual depends on what kind of housing you live in. So you live in a three room flat, I think it's like $300. Four rooms, like maybe $250. Why is it called GST? GST it's called a GST voucher because the government's message is that, oh, because um, to help lower income families defray the cost of living. Oh, that's why it's called GST. So the government gives you money from GST, right? Then you pay tax. Right? So that's why it's called GST. Okay. Yeah. Because it's like a tax on the income that you earn. Yeah. 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 Ye
when I thought you exchange rates, I gave you all the example of the Malaysia house, right? If you buy a house in Malaysia, it go and price by 20%, but then Najib corrupted, you know, the currency dropped by a third, you'll still lose money. So currency is very important in investments, right? A stable currency environment is very crucial to drive FDI. Unless people they don't come. Okay, so that's the that's the simpler but more but less important reason. Now the more important reason has to do with MFOP. We need to keep a lid on this gradually over time. Why? Every country will experience inflation, correct? Every healthy economy around the world will experience inflation. Which means that if your exchange rate stay constant over time, your imports will get more and more, more and more expensive simply because the countries that you buy from will get more and more prosperous. Right? As they grow, their GPL go up. Their GPL go up, what they sell to you will become more expensive. So to keep ahead of that, you need to keep appreciating your currency to make sure that you keep keeping those imports cheap. And that's more important reason. Okay, then in practice, uh, this, especially this, this is really for evaluation one. In the body of your essay, you're always allowed to say depreciation. Okay, but because of the outsized impact on Singapore, when you depreciate, we actually almost never depreciate in principle. We have a zero appreciation stance, which means that we keep our bands constant. Now here's the thing, okay? Take note, huh? when we have a zero appreciation stance, right? Doesn't mean that we won't depreciate. Because it's a managed flow. It's just that the central bank won't depreciate. Market forces can take it down. Follow? The currency can depreciate. It's just that the central bank won't depreciate it actively. Right? We just don't appreciate, just leave it. And then we let the free market go see wherever it wants to push the exchange rate to go. Okay? Questions? Okay, great. Just like half an hour, you can start doing your trade. Trade recycles a lot of macro uh, content that we have learned. Starting with things like ADAS, macro goals, even policies. Right? You need to have a good perspective of those things and you need to use them again in trade. So throw nothing away. Right, the framework still stays, trade just gives you a bit more information. Because ultimately, when we study international trade, right, we are not learning something new, but we are looking deeper into the exponential component. Correct? We are looking deeper into the MFOP component. So we have learned it before, it's just that it was more superficial. Now we are looking in that. So everything we learn in macro is still relevant. So I always say, when you study trade, you learn it as macro plus. Okay? Especially in the dawn of new globalization, this, we're going to recycle even more macro stuff. Kind of. Okay? So keep that in mind. Now, simple definitions first. So, trade, what's trade? Simple up, right? We already know that it's just buying and selling of goods and services between countries. So, you've got exports, imports, and then makes up trade. The first thing we want to try to understand is why do countries trade, right? And at a simple level, before we go into theories, it's really this few general things. The first one is to understand that countries trade, you see, trade theories are, are a rather recent invention, meaning 100 over years old. But ships, merchants, and trades existed like for hundreds of years, right? Even before the subject economics came up, the Chinese, with their Chinese junk and all that, they were already trading, right? The, uh, What's it called? The East India Company, right? Under the British, they're already trading and they're also in the 1800s. So why do countries trade, right? Three reasons, okay? The overarching idea is that they have different condition, conditions of production, which we can break down into three things. The first one is there are different proportions of factor inputs, right? Every country has different squad factor endowments in different proportions. So what you're good at making, what you can make will be very different from me. So trade is largely driven by a demand for things that you can make that I cannot, right? That's a very simple level. That's what it means. The second point is economic resources are unevenly distributed around the world. The first one focuses more about proportions, right? That means everyone has different proportions of labor and capital. Point number two takes into account of the fact of countries like Singapore, where we literally have no natural resources. That is a very good example of the unevenness of resource distribution. Lastly, and most importantly, is that on some level, the mobility of certain resources are extremely limited. Why is that a big deal? Because if that weren't the case, then trade would largely revolve around trading raw materials. They just produce it domestically, 
because it saves a lot on transport. The finished product will typically be harder to transport than the, than the raw material itself. Right? You just think about something like a car. When I ship a car, right, actually there's a lot of empty space, correct? You get what I mean? Like everything in the car, that there's no one sitting there, that's empty space. So that reduces the number of cars I can ship. But you ship things like metal, you ship things like, like oil and all that, it's extremely compact. So much easier and more cost efficient to ship raw materials. Alright? So if everything were mobile, we would just ship raw materials and we just make it in house. We just make it uh, on shore. But because not all vehicles of production are mobile, we are forced to trade goods and services. Okay? So why they have to trade in one simple term is that because they have different specialties. Okay? I probably have enough time to only finish this, so that's what I plan to do. Now, this is the first major theory you're going to learn. It's important because this is literally a part A essay on its own. Okay? Theory of comparative advantage. Now, before I teach you the theory of comparative advantage, I always like to preface it with the theory of absolute advantage. Okay. This is not in your syllabus, but it's a good, simple building block to understand why comparative advantage makes sense and why do we talk about comparative advantage. So, absolute advantage was the very first trade theory, right? Which says that absolute advantage, right? This concept, a country is said to have an absolute advantage over another if you can produce more of everything. That's what we call an absolute advantage, okay? When you can produce more of everything. Now, the theory goes that if you can produce more of everything than me, there's no reason for us to trade. In other words, the theory of absolute advantage came organically as a result of what we discussed on the previous page, which is, oh, it makes sense for countries to trade in what they don't have, right? I buy what I don't have from you, you buy what you don't have from me. If everything you have, I have, then we shouldn't be trading with each other. That's what absolute advantage says. Now, comparative advantage, on the other hand, preaches something very different. Comparative advantage itself is the ability to produce something at a lower up cost. That means you have to give out less to produce that thing. Okay? So the theory of comparative advantage says that countries should specialize and export what they have a comparative advantage in and import what they have a comparative disadvantage in. Or if they do have a comparative advantage, they should import that. So it's a very different thinking, okay, from absolute advantage. Now, the way my tables are set up, it's set up to illustrate how comparative advantage disproves the theory of absolute advantage. Okay, so that's something to keep that in mind as I go through this table. Now, before I go into the tables, right, keep something in mind. Now. You ever get a part A essay on comparative advantage, uh, I must see the tables. It's a scoring point. You have to memorize them. Okay? I need to see all four, or in some schools, in some cases, they give you three. It's fine. If your school gives you three, then three. If your school gives you four, then four. Okay? Next thing to note, my numbers are different from yours. It depends on what your school nerds are trying to illustrate. Okay? But the fundamental logic is the same. So you follow my logic. Okay, you follow my logic, but you can use your school numbers. Last thing, okay? In these tables, there are some things you need to memorize, some things can be derived. Meaning, some of the numbers there can be derived, so you don't have to mark everything. But never try to derive everything in an exam. You better memorize the basics, then you derive the rest. You try to count with the number in the exam, you're gonna die, okay? One last thing. These tables, can you don't draw? Can. But you must replace them with a PPC. In other words, TOCA, theory of comparative advantage, can be illustrated in two ways. Tables, PPC. PPC is harder, but PPC saves time. Okay, I'll show you later, later what I mean. But the reason why PPC saves time, right, is because you don't have to draw more tables. But why it's harder is because you need to memorize more stuff. The tables are actually very nice because it follows a very nice flow. You draw a table, you explain, it leads you to the next one, you explain, it leads you to the next one, leads you to the next one. So the table helps your explanation. Meaning if you mark the tables, you can derive the explanation on the spot in the exam. 
But with PPC, you have to construct everything from memory. And it shows you a bit, uh, it doesn't show you the, the, the thing so sequentially. So I'll show you what I did as we go along the way. Okay? So in the theory of comparative advantage, right, we're going to use four tables to illustrate why this theory makes sense. Right? Is this theory really true? Does it really make sense? Is it advantageous to specialize in what you have comparative advantage in and you know, export what you're good at and import what you don't? So that's the objective here, okay? So we start with the table that says before specialization. Our setup is we assume each country can only produce two goods. Okay, in my case, wheat and cloth. Okay, you can only produce two goods, there's two countries. Wheat and cloth. The setup also assumes that US has an absolute advantage over China, which of course this is right. Bullshit, like, we all know it's not true, like, okay? but that's the setup. US has an absolute advantage over China. So if we can prove up that Trading by CA is advantageous, then we have indirectly disproved the existence of absolute advantage. Okay? Now, this first table of numbers you have to memorize. Okay? One key assumption here is that we assume FOPs are split 50 50 between wheat and cloth. Okay? That is, my cable is showing you that right now, US is producing 100 wheat and 60 cloth. And China is producing 5 wheat and 10 cloth. Why am I emphasizing this like that? Because some schools in their first table like to present it as the maximum amounts. So some schools will present it as 200 and 120 and 10 and 20. Okay, so what I'm saying to you is this, you just need to know what your tables are showing you. Mine, I'm showing you they're producing both on the assumption that they split their FOP 50 50 into each thing. Okay? So I'm telling you that your notes all might be different. It might be 100% of FOP. That means they produce either or. So you need to be clear. These are things you need to explain even when you're writing the answer. Okay? So like both the V and the cloth get equal FOP. Hmm. Okay. You have to memorize all numbers in that table. Yeah, this number, this, okay, of course the last one I have to need, like, this simple math, like, this plus this. Like. So you have to memorize all numbers. Okay? Now, the good news is that the next table is 100% derived. There's nothing that you need to memorize here. The next table is very important. It's the op cost table. Okay? The op cost table. So, what does the op cost table show you? Very simple. Like. It shows you the op cost of the various goods for various countries, okay? So it's a simple primary school level ratio or secondary school level ratios. Simple ratios, right? So like for the US, one wheat costs 0.6 cloth to make. The reason why we can do this is because of our assumption that it's 50-50 split in the FOP. So in other words, we are saying the amount of resources that we have can either produce 100 wheat and 60 cloth, right? So it's just 100 is to 60, then you just divide throughout, like, 1 is 2.6. Right? So we are assuming that if I produce one less bit, I can produce 0.6 more cloth. So you can derive this table 100%. Right? Because I assume I split 50 50 resources, 50% 50 in the wheat, 50% in the cloth. Right? So this is, my, this is my ratio. So one more bit will cost me 0.6 cloth and vice versa. Okay? Now, then for cloth, it's actually just the reciprocal. If your math is strong, you just flip it. Like, you know that it's just divide by 0.6 throughout. Like. Right? You want to do it the simpler way, then you just flip these two numbers. You just do this, and then you divide by 16 throughout. Okay? But if you are strong, then you know that you just, you're just effectively flipping the ratio. 1 means to 0.6, you just divide by 0.6 throughout. It's the same idea. Okay? Then you repeat from here, here is 5 is to 10, here is 10 is to 5. So this of us table 100% divide. Right. Okay? So what we've done so far is the first table is all assumptions. Second table is we're deriving the op cost. Okay, we're deriving the op cost. Now, what we need to do next is we need to find out the comparative advantage. So we compare vertically by product category, okay? You're not comparing like that, huh? you're comparing like that. You're comparing 
for that good, which country has a comparative advantage? Because remember, CA is a comparative measure versus your trading partners. So it's a relative measure. Okay, so we look. Very obvious that USA has a CA in wheat and China has a CA in corn. Okay? So now when we get to table 3, table 3 is a specialization table. Okay, table 3 is a specialization table. Now there's something peculiar about my table that might be different from yours. Okay, again in my table, because I assume absolute advantage first, in this particular case, although you're supposed to specialize according to your comparative advantage, I assume that US only partially specializes and China fully specializes. That's an assumption in my model. Okay, what does full specialization mean? It means you only produce what you're good at. Partial means you produce more of, but you still produce the other thing. Okay, this is mine. Yours, I, it depends on what your school shows. Okay, some schools will show this, some schools will show a full specialization. That means it will be 0, 20, and then it will be uh, uh, wheat, and then corn will be 0 for the other guy. Okay, but the principle is the same. The principle is the same. It's just what you want to show. So the reason why I show it like that is for two reasons. One is because US has an absolute advantage over China. If US produces no cloth at all, right, there wouldn't be enough cloth in the world. In, in my this world. Make sense? Because you see, uh, if only China produces cloth, right, global cloth production was 70. So if only China produces cloth, that's not enough. Right? So that's one function of the assumption I made. More realistically, uh, later as we go down the topic, right, another good justification for partial specialization is if you fully specialize, that industry died, your whole economy will die. Give you a simple example. You also have software. You ever see that in the news? Softbank? No? What's that? Softbank is a Japanese company, right? The founder invested in Alibaba, but Alibaba was a tiny company. He bought 20% of the company, which became like a few, like tens of billion dollars stake lah, eventually. So he's, a, he's an investor. Softbank is a hundred billion dollar investment fund. More than half of it is financed by the Saudi Arabia royal family. Okay? So they put 50 over billion in the SoftBank fund. The SoftBank fund invested in Uber, WeWork, Grab, all the technology companies in the world. So why I talk about them is because the Saudi family, right? You know why they're doing that? Why are they investing in all this different stuff? Because they're very dependent on oil. So the day solar comes and you don't need oil, your entire company gets wiped out. Your entire country gets wiped out. That's the problem of being fully specialized in one industry. Okay, so I'm telling you that later on, I'll show you more justifications for why partial specialization makes sense. But for now, just understand that it's an assumption that I make. Okay, the specialization part doesn't change, but the extent to which they specialize is a decision made by me. So if your notes do full specialization, it's fine, it's good with that. Okay? Now, so because of this, uh, my partial specialization, the thing I assume is that I plus 10 wheat and I minus 6 cloth only. Okay, that is ordinarily you do full specialization, you just go to zero. Uh. But in my case, I assume I produce 10 more wheat, and according to my outcast table, that means I have to produce 6 less crop. Okay, so the specialization fact doesn't change, you are producing more of what you are good at. But the number more crop that I choose to produce is arbitrary. Okay, I decided that in my model, I'm just going to produce 10 more wheat for 6 more crop. Now the first thing to notice is to pay attention to the total production. Now what you immediately realize is that there's an increase in global production. Which is amazing, right? Because I didn't change the amount of FOP I had. I didn't change the amount of technology I had. All I did was to make the countries that have a comparative advantage in something produce more of it. And the outcome is actually very logical. Because when a country is more efficient in producing something and you allocate more resources towards it and away from the other thing, you get incrementally more right, than what they're giving up. So you don't have to think from a country point of view, right? Even think about just like, let's say you and your friend, you're all going to do an amazing race. Right? Or you team up to do a certain challenge. Everyone focusing on what they're good at helps the collective outcome. 
That's basically what we're saying. Right? It's like specialization of labor in the theory of the firm. When you specialize, you get better at what you're doing, your output is incrementally more. That's exactly what happens, except this is on a global level. Right? You allocate resources. Which country is best at producing what? You can produce it. And that is good for everyone because everyone has more now. And then the final step is you trade. Okay? So the assumption here, okay, so there's another assumption here. Okay, the assumption here is that we'll trade 10 V for 10 Corp. Okay? Wait, what's the, what's the period of um, that I'm producing 10 more wheat and I'm sacrificing 6 more cloth in the process. But yours, like I said, yours is likely to be different. Yours could be that cloth just goes to zero. Okay? Okay, okay so the assumption here we treat that wheat for that cloth. Now, do we need to memorize the number? Yeah, you have Northern to. Top one. Which one? You have to replicate all four tables in your essay. So you have to replicate every single number, right? But this table is fully derived. This one, what you have to remember is that it's basically this, but plus 10 minus 6, or whatever, whatever it is that your notes show you. So most likely your notes one, if it's just full specialization, right? One of it will be zero, and then the other one will just, you can just follow what your original table tells you. Because on your first table, right, you like I said, it's either they tell you what you can produce at maximum or they do 50-50. In any case, you know what the maximum specialization will be. You know how much the firm can produce at max, right? It's just that in my case, it's a bit special. I do partial, so my assumption is I produce 10 more and I sacrifice 6 more. Okay? Now, 10 is arbitrary. But this ratio of 1 is to 1 is derived. Okay? Why is it derived? Any idea? Partially derived, if you are being precise. So why is it one to one? This is something you have to explain huh? when you draw the diagram. Why does it have to be one to one? See, the logic is very simple, right? US is selling one week and getting one call back in return. Right? So when the US uh, sell wheat, right? What's the minimum amount in cloth you have to pay them for them to be willing to sell to you? You're selling one unit of wheat, right? For one unit of cloth. What's the minimum that China needs to pay US to make them sell them the wheat? Hmm? How much they cost Which is, where, where do you see it? You see it on the table. So the minimum for well, the ratio is 0 0.6 cloth. What's the maximum that China is willing to pay? Huh? 1.67. So this one. Is 1.67 the maximum China is willing to pay? Two. Two. The maximum is two. Because that will be how much they cost to make it themselves. So that's why I say this is partially derived. Because it doesn't have to be one to one, but the ratio needs to lie within this range. It must be at least equal to how much it costs the US to produce, and less than how much, or, or, at, or the max will be equal to how much China will need to produce it themselves. So is it within or inclusive? It's inclusive. My apologies. So actually it's partially derived, right? Because it doesn't have to be one. It can be one by four, one by five, or whatever it is. As long as it sits within, within the range. But it has to sit within the range. Because if it doesn't sit within the range, it won't be mutually beneficial to trade. So in this case, the trade is mutually beneficial. Huh? China saved money, US gets to profit. Okay? It's a big deal. Okay? So of course on the last table the total doesn't change, but what's significant is if you compare this set of numbers with the original set of numbers, you realize that there's an increase in consumption in each of the respective countries. Okay, there's an increase in consumption in each of the respective countries.
Okay? So China used to be 5 and 10, now they consume 10 and 10. US used to consume 160, now they are 164. So what does this prove to you? This proves to you that theory of comparative advantage works. Right? It improves global production and consumption of goods and services. Right? And it also disproves absolute advantage. It shows you that even if a country has an absolute advantage over the other, it's still mutually beneficial to trade. Which is why other countries that are larger than us trade with us. Right? Much of what Singapore can produce, every other country can produce. Right? But where uh, uh, we are different is that we could have a comparative advantage in some areas. We could be better at producing something in certain areas. Although you can make it also, I can do it cheaper. So it makes more sense for me to do it, and then we trade with each other. But we produce people. We produce services, that's more accurate, right? So there's banking services. Right? So for example, in Malaysia, yeah, they can produce banking services, but they might choose to bank with us, so we'll buy our banking services because we've got cooperative advantage in that. Okay? Well, in practice, it's not so straightforward. Right? In practice, it will be, if you talk about something like banking, you'll be, talk, you'll be talking about things like, it's, it's more product negotiation than anything else. Right? Like the fact that Singapore banks have, uh, maybe because we are more reputable, in terms of like stability and all that, we have more access to different markets around the world. So you bank with us, right? you bank in Singapore, the Singapore bank can help you to invest all over the world. But in Malaysia, because they don't have a good reputation, they don't get access to that kind of investment. That will be more um, a more realistic reason right? with regards to things like banking. Right? But comparative advantage will apply more to things like, if you're talking about manufacturing and agriculture, then the comparative advantage will be more obvious. It's kind of like, oh, if this piece of land I use for agriculture, I could have used it for, for uh, manufacturing, right? So my output cost is actually very high to do agriculture because I could produce something of a lot more economic value. But Singapore is also clear part, right? When it comes to services, okay? I'm going to stop here. I'm going to pick up from here next week and we're going to talk about the same set of things but how to show it on the TPC, okay? Okay, thanks. Back up, I will... Please attend the